on ransomware and recovery. So we uh, want to thank you all first and foremost for spending the next 45 minutes-ish with us. We have some great speakers lined up for you. Uh, Mr. Manny Punzo, our Data Management and Protection Director uh, with Technologen. David Martinez, our Cybersecurity Director with Technologen. And David Siles, um, our Global Field CTO from Rubrik. So before we get into the scary stuff, let's talk a little about the fun stuff. So at the end of the webinar, we have a little survey for you. And uh, we appreciate the information you guys can provide. And so in, in, because of that appreciation, we have a, uh, the ability to basically be entered into a, to, to win a ring doorbell. So sticking with that whole security thing. So uh, take some time at the end and uh, appreciate it. Now, let's get to the scary stuff. So when, when we start talking about ransomware, we have some pretty eye-opening stats that we'll provide in just a few. But as James Scott mentions here, there's, there's an emotional aspect to ransomware. Right, so there's an emotional element that, that we have to combat. So how do we do that? What can we put in place to avoid that emotional aspect? So some business drivers and some best practices that basically allow us to put a solid plan or a phased best practice approach is, is, is key to simplifying this process when it comes to ransomware prevention. So when, when it comes up to the, the phase of preparation, what we mean by that is building a plan, identifying the who, the what, and the how communication, um, really what can we automate to, you know, in first and foremost, and really just developing that, uh, that general, um, general, general plan related to a recovery strategy. Um, when we talk about prevention, you know, we can't stress enough the importance of implementing a cybersecurity strategy. And that goes into, you know, also training our employees. Now, we all know that Nigerian Prince is probably a good guy, but it's probably not the best thing in the world to click that link, right? Now, when we talk about the phase of, of detection, we're really pointing to you know implementing processes and tools to detect and analyze the ransom before it's even activated. Um, moving on to that assessment phase, we're really talking about isolating systems that have been infected and assessing the scope of the attack so we can neutralize that attack. Now, in the recovery piece, really what we're, we're pointing to is is determining the type of recovery required. So whether it's a file-based rec uh, recovery or even just basically the decryption of data. Um, the bottom line is probably the most critical piece is to eliminate that emotional feel is recovering the priority developed during the preparation phase. So basically it boils down to being prepared before an attack by, by shaping the strategic pieces so they fit into the defined goals of the organization. Now, let's kick off a poll because I'm actually curious what the biggest challenge your organization is facing today. And while this is going on, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A button. So if y'all have any questions as we progress through this, please put them in there and at the end of the session, um, we'll go ahead and have a, uh, the Q&A at the end. All right, Melissa, let's see what these results are. All of the above. I would have put a pretty good chunk of change on that, that that was going to be the answer. And what's nice about this is as I introduce our next speakers, it, all those answers basically correlate to the conversations from a cybersecurity and data management perspective. So um, I'd love to introduce my bet, some of my great friends, uh, Mr. David Martinez, our cybersecurity director, and Mr. Manny Punzo, our data management protection area director. Uh, gentlemen, Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Trent. Can everybody hear me all right, I hope? Um, I hope everyone's keeping healthy, right? It looks like uh, based on the participant list, we have a great turnout. So thank you all for joining. Oh, I just got some feedback. Uh, today, as, as Trent mentioned, obviously he did a great job of just kind of setting the, the groundwork for us. You know, today's conversation is ransomware and how Rubrics data management platform is helping organizations mitigate risk, right, in the event of a uh, cyber attack. But before we get into it, uh, David and I would like to take a few minutes and provide our perspective on the importance of data security and data protection as it relates to, rent the, to, to the ransomware conversation. Okay, try it. next one. Next slide, Trent, uh, thank you. Uh, so data management, right? That's, that's a big buzzword. 
you know, we're, we're living in a data driven world, a world where the data, data is the most important asset to a business. And the growing requirements around data privacy, data compliance, adoption of cloud resources, and the continuous ransomware attacks has changed the way businesses have to manage their data. It's an era where the business owners and IT share the responsibility of implementing a strategy around people, process, and technology to ensure that the data is safe and compliant. And that's something that uh, David will allude to here in a minute. You know, as, as I mentioned, data management is a very popular topic, but what does that really mean? Um, in conversations with organizations and customers, it, you know, data management way too often uh, include security, data compliance, data privacy, and data protection are used in the same context. And, and it's really important for us to understand the difference. And, and really, uh, critical, it's critical that processes and, po and policies are put in place around these components as they are key to a solid data management strategy. On the topic of ransomware, however, you know, it, it's really important um, that we put a reliable data security and data protection strategy in place. And uh, here's where I'll turn to Dave to give uh, his perspective from the data security uh, lens, if you will. What are your thoughts, David? Thanks, Manny. So um, I, I guess this is probably a little more of a, a complex answer than it seems on the surface. Um, for many years, data management and data security have existed in two separate silos. The management has really been the purvey of operational groups and the, uh, the security side obviously has belonged inside a, a subsection for, you know, security analysts and, you know, managed by the CISOs type. And really when you look at the principal tenets of security, um, anyone that's been inside the security space for years now knows this, but confidentiality, integrity, and availability are the key pieces or the principal tenets of data security. And so you've got things like encryption and authentication as subsets to uh, your, your confidentiality pieces, but availability, the, those pieces are really driven around your data management and you know, your DR plans, your, your overall cyber event recovery plans, those things of that nature. And so I think more than ever, what we are really starting to see is the, the two groups are coming together and sort of building that bridge to, uh, to address the availability section of data security. And so your, your encryption and authentication platforms are, uh, are key. And obviously the availability pieces are, are, you know, part of what we're really discussing today. And then the, the integrity section is just ensuring that the data hasn't changed since the last time you, you um, correctly accessed it. All of that type of stuff has to come together operationally across the people and fit into the processes as well. And then you've got to have the technology to enable it. Excellent. Thanks for that. Change the slides, Trent. Yeah. So let's let's get into the ransomware topic, right? So so what is ransomware? Uh, as we all know, ransomware is a virus that comp compromises businesses by encrypting their data and holding not only data but their IT systems hostage, right? Until a ransom is paid. This typically or usually leads into a loss of production, loss of data, and ultimately loss of revenue. Um, you know, great examples, right? Let's not forget Sony Pictures in 2014 or the damage that WannaCry did in 2017. Um, today's though, today's most common type of ransomware is phishing emails, right? These hackers or cyber criminals as they're called send out thousands of emails per day in hopes that some poor soul is gonna fall for the trick and click on a malicious link. In more unusual cases though, uh, the intrusion happens within an organization. A bad actor or a spy, as they're called, could potentially gain access to your systems and then employs a criminal organization that provide ransomware as a service. Then once the hack is in place and the ransom is paid, the uh, profits are split. So, um, not, not, you know, this is not one bag of tricks, right? There's different ways uh, that uh, 
organizations and businesses get compromised. Um, you know, we again, we, we've been we've been uh, ransomware has been plaguing the businesses for several decades, and now these attacks have become more and more sophisticated. Um, it depends on what you read or, or you know the newscast. I mean, ransomware is a multi-billion dollar a year business, and the financial impact on organizations can be astronomical. If organizations don't have a reliable or efficient way to restore their systems or recover their data, it's often easier for them to pay the ransom, right? And, and that's not good. And, and believe me when I tell you, these criminals are keeping track of who pays and the, organi the organizations that pay may or may not get their data back. So there's no guarantee. Uh, but there is a guarantee though, if ransoms are paid, uh, you're probably likely to get hit again Next, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> everyone's talking about how can you prevent it? Um, how can you prevent ransomware? I, I think uh, it's, it's difficult to prevent a cyber attack, right? But there are measures that business can take to minimize the intrusion. In my opinion, cyber hygiene is very important. Doing things like patching your networks regularly and rapidly um, leveraging dual or multi-factor authentication for passwords, locking down networks and firewalls, leveraging tools that help detect and prevent the spread of the virus, right? And, and, and implementing a secure data protection strategy along with a clear cyber recovery plan, right? And I emphasize cyber recovery plan because many instances, organizations are looping the cyber recovery plan into a disaster recovery plan. And I wanna emphasize that there's a difference and we could have a separate sidebar conversation on what that looks like. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that I like to mention is obviously during these tough times of work from home, uh, protecting employee endpoint devices and reinforcing email etiquette is, is critical. And with that, I'll turn it back to Trent. Hey, thanks Manny. So as usual, great, great insight from, from Manny and from DMR. We appreciate you guys joining us today. Um, there's definitely a huge amount of education needs to happen related to the cyber stuff. So much appreciated. So let's take another poll. Um, so let's, let's, let's hear from, from you all related to how important data protection is related to a ransomware recovery. So this should be a quick poll. Um, just really curious is, you know, you'd be surprised how many times you read this question and see, we see these answers and it's a 50, 50 model, right? Um, it's data protection seems to be a key element for some and, and for others, it's not uh, really, it should be probably the forefront related to a bigger conversation related to cybersecurity, data management, et cetera. All right, let's go ahead and see these results. Very nice. Everyone passed the test. That's always a good thing. All right. Well, it's, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, um, one of the sharpest gentlemen I know, Mr. David Stiles, Global Field CTO of Rubric. Uh, David, thank you for being here with us today. Hey, thanks, Ron. Thanks, thanks for having for you. Great. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Dave Siles. I'm the Global Field CTO at Rubric. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about cyber resiliency, but starting with just a quick overview of who Rubric is for those of you who may not be familiar with this. Um, Rubric, we, we started about six years ago, and we really came to market to reinvent how people took a look at data management. There really has not been much innovation in the last 20 years in the data management space, and, and this model was ripe for innovation and disruption. And so Rubric came into the market space took a look at the complexity of how people have been managing data backups, data management, data catalogs, and then being able to take and exploit the power of the cloud coming into the market space and giving customers another option. And so we take that complex architecture, we collapse it into a single so scalable software fabric that allows for infinite scale out capabilities while taking advantage of the public and private cloud uh, through a data management plane that gives the customers ultimate flexibility uh, with, with managing their data with Rubrik. Uh, our journey starts very simply with the deployment of the Rubrik solution. Um, it's a rack and stack, uh, an auto discovery solution, typically up and running in under four hours. 
Customers then take advantage of our market-leading intelligent SLA policy engine, which allows you to take your business requirements of your recovery point objectives, recovery time objectives, as business policy and apply it against your architecture and your assets that you want to protect, and letting us handle the complexity of when they should be run and how the backup job should be scheduled. No more of the back-end tedious management has to be put on uh, the end user in, in our equation. We obviously were built with hyperconvergence with the ability to take and massively paralyze our scale and so it gives the ability to rapidly ingest data, eliminating you know, some of the complexities that come with backing up massive amounts of, of architecture, virtual machines, and databases. And you know, obviously no one backs up just to back up in the time of need when you have application down or infrastructure down, or you want to leverage your backups for a business purpose to be able to do um, DevOps type of functionality, we have the ability to leverage our architecture to offer a flexible recovery of live mount virtual machines, point in time Oracle and SQL database recoveries. We do give our customers a Google-like functional search across all the data under management. And we need to really integrate with VMware to give you near zero RPO uh, protection with continuous data protection. Everything we do at Rubrik is secure end to end and encrypted. One of the very unique things about Rubrik is our immutable file system, which we're going to talk about deeper today. It gives us natural immutability against things like ransomware. And we were built in the cloud generation for the cloud. Uh, we have the ability to take and allow our customers to exploit um, the power of using the cloud for not only long-term cold archive, but also for using it as compute or uh, journey to the cloud. And that journey to the cloud starts most likely with customers leveraging us for uh, premise on backup and then using the cloud as a, as a target location. But as customers make the decision to move to the cloud and looking for cyber resiliency, we have the ability to convert those workloads to being able to be used in a cloud native format. And for the infrastructure as a service and platform as a service customers who've made cloud native decisions, we offer options in that space to do cloud native protection. But Rubrik really, that's just the start of our story, not the end of our story. Uh, data protection here really does more. And we do that by taking the metadata that's being protected under management into our Polaris SaaS platform. This industry leading platform then allows us to take and harness the business value of the metadata and unlock it through a series of applications. The first one that came on the market was the global GPS product. that allows you to have a single pane of glass for all of your rubric assets under management. Rubric radar, uh, Polaris radar um, is our anomaly based detection engine for helping to discover when you've been impacted with things like a ransomware attack or in, uh, insider threat and, and helping you identify that and automate the recovery, you'll see this in live today in our demo. We do Office 365 native protection, cloud native workload, and we have a new product we just launched in this space allowing you to do very deep uh, unstructured data analytics, looking for data classification to center your information, aligning it to the compliance the landscape of the world, things like GDPR and CCPA. Uh, ransomware obviously is is many well uh, set up it is a pandemic among itself you know it is over a billion dollar criminal enterprise it's going to be close to two billion dollars of ransom paid this year it's a market that's continuing to increase and, and it has legs now you know the question i always get asked is why are customers paying uh, the ransom and we really can see it breaking down into three different areas the first is the length of downtime you know the average recovery time is a little over seven days according to forrester it's a lot of business downtime for customers that sometimes can not just take that impact. A second and a bigger one that's it's obviously becoming a more and more prevalent issue is some of the legacy backup architectures that run on those uh, systems that have open platforms and open storage points. They become targets to ransomware attack themselves, completely getting encrypted or deleted before the attack is proliferating against the primary data, allowing the customer not even to have a chance to recover. And then just the lack of visibility, you know, understanding what was actually impacted. It's also a very time intensive process. And if you can't understand what was impacted, it's hard to get back to steady state recovery. Now, all you have to do is open the newspaper and you'll read a story about every different vertical. Someone's being impacted on a daily basis by ransomware. And it's not something that's again slowing down. And as we currently sit with the pandemic issue of COVID-19, you know, it's a real-time changing landscape. You know, as Manny has pointed out, you know, users have been moving to the edge. Corporate v corporate walls are now being stretched to the VPNs to the edge. 
attackers aware of this. They're adapting their techniques and their attack vector uh, based on this, and they're even leveraging some of the messaging of the pandemic as part of their initial phishing ve vectors. And we see, at least in the customer bases that we talk with on a day to day basis, you know, state, local, education, healthcare, those that are really on the front line are also being markedly increased in terms of attacks right now. Now, ransomware has been around for a while. You know, the first known version of ransomware was PC8 back in 1989, really just kind of a nuisance. And, you know, as we went through kind of history here, you know, in 2005, we had the, the primarily on system local data impacts. And these were typically remediated through things like antivirus and spam filtering and even user training. On um, that second wave in the, in the early 2010s, we really saw the wall, the crypto wall and torrent locker type of, come, of attacks come into place. This is where you started really having to depend on strategic backups and next generation antivirus to really try to rob recovery. Although the encryption keys were typically still left on systems. And so identifying those encryption keys to recover was still possible. And then we hit the 2015, 2016 timeframe, and we really get into this third wave where things started getting serious. WannaCry and Cerber, Locky were coming out into the market space. These typically went to using a command and control architecture in the cloud, requiring that customers have an offline network backup. Um, many customers did not survive these type of attacks with local remediation and started paying ransom. This is just where the, the race has been on. And as we sit here today, you know, we're really in this critical wave. You know, the attacks have become very uh, systematically complex. Um, they're very highly efficient. They're polymorphing on deployment. And so everybody's getting hit with almost essentially a zero day attack. This is driving the needs for things like having an absolutely guaranteed immutable backup, using things that are helping the customer to identify when an attack is happening through artificial intelligence and insert machine learning to determining for recovery, I'm sorry, determination of recovery, um, you know, and, and companies are having to take out insurance policies now to make sure that if they, if they are being hit, that they have the ability to pay a ransom. Now there's different types of attacks that fall into the ransomware category. The most prevalent would be an encryption based ransomware attack. These are the typical ones that most people hear about. The most prevalent kind of you're probably going to be impacted with if you were hit with ransomware. These go at the encryption of the files and sensitive information. They typically go at the backup architecture first, then encrypt the high value data, and then we'll pop up a warning saying you've been encrypted. You know, please pay us in this amount of time to get your encryption key and they'll give you great customer service and tell you exactly how to buy Bitcoin and where to go for, for servicing that request. Now, lock screen ransomware is not as prevalent anymore. It's more of a nuisance than typically antivirus malware will help you remediate this or going through safe mode and removing that. Um, and some of this is obviously something that's become kind of second place. And then the last category would be hardware-based lockerware ransomware. This is stuff that goes to the master boot record or the firmware of the system. Typically, it's not evident until the system reboot happens, but it typically when you are impacted with this type of an attack, like a pet, yeah, you're going to be using new hardware to get back in recovery. So you need to have a full state system image backup as well. Now, uh, here's how a typical ransomware attack happens. And the anatomy starts with the um, campaign. This is the phishing attack that's using social engineering or weaponized website to help the user to click on some payload that'll drop down a helper application to bring down the infected code. This dropper application is not the ransomware itself, it's the payload pieces that come in and bring the executable to help start loading and staging the ransomware itself. And that staging process will happen. It'll get it set up in the system, inject into the registry, make sure that it persists through reboots. And then typically what will happen is the ransom will go into a dormancy mode and sometimes it will dwell for 30, 60, 90 days, really just to make sure that it gets in every good known backup depending on your retention cycle. When it's time to start uh, the process of kicking off the attack, the scan control, uh, command and control server will kick off a scan request and this will start looking for the primary target to encrypt. It'll use some of the intelligence to the gather through its process of identifying key loggers and passwords, try to expand the surface as much as possible and affect the most amount of data. And then the encryption attack will actually kick off. This will happen extremely quick. Today's Intel processors have offloaded uh, accelerators for encryption. And once the attack is done, you'll be presented with the payday requirement for the Bitcoin. Um, the goal here is to break this cycle. Right? 
Uh, the weakest link in any security uh, ecosystem is always going to be the human firewall. You know, I'm not saying you're not going to spend money for your firewall, it's antivirus and antivirus and encryption and backup robotics, but you still have to train the human firewall. So if you're not fishing your own employees and training them through good security hygiene practices, you need to do that. Now, if you are impacted, you should have an attack recovery plan. And obviously, the recovery plan is going to start with the fact of uh, identifying, you know, were you hit with ransomware or were you impacted with a data loss event? Uh, typically, when you're impacted with ransomware specifically, you're, you're going to know it. You're suddenly not going to have issues uh, or going to have issues opening files. You know, you're going to get messages that um, your files have been encrypted. You're going to have that persistent pop-up. You know, typically, we'll see a ransom note asking you uh, to pay the ransom and giving you instructions on how to decrypt your files. Um, oftentimes, these uh, will pop up uh, and persist on the desktop until uh, the ransom is paid. Now, if you're if you're impacted with ransomware, you really want to limit the amount of scope of what's going to be impacted. So you need to get the infected systems off the network or drop the network as a whole. And don't forget about things beyond just Ethernet cables, you know, other network protocols like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, where that can still transfer across. And then you've got to look for the scope of the infection. You, know, you start with patient zero, but then look at all the map drives and share drives and network attached locations um, and identifying where else there may be encrypted files. And this is where things such as um, machine learning and artificial intelligence can help you identify this. Um, identifying which ransomware you hit, there's a few different ways to do that. Um, a couple of these links are in here when you see the presentation after, um, after the day, we'll make sure that these links are shared with you. But, you know, some good resources there you can use, but really you want to determine how you're going to best respond. And you know, the, the best response obviously is not have to pay a ransom. And the only way to guarantee that is really recover from an immutable backup. Um, if you don't have an immutable backup, then you're going to go down the, the next best uh, to worst options. You know, is there a decryptor tool or known key available for that type of ransomware to recover? Um, you can refuse to pay. You can say the value of the business, the data uh, just isn't worth uh, the ransom and we're just going to start over. And if you are making the decision to pay the ransom, obviously engage the right forensic team to help you, but also negotiate. Now, if you really want to get started, you know, um, planning this is the best time to do this before the attack. You know, you really need to prevent it, to implement a ransomware prevention program with a strong education component for your employees. Um, and then similar to tests, you know, you have to fire your these type of plans. Um, you want to make sure you have good immutable backups and that you have that copy that's protected so they can't be impacted by the ransomware. You know, leverage things like some of the new generation technologies that will help you accelerate the tech response. And then continuously test your plan. You know, engage partners as well like technology to help you accelerate uh, your plan if you need that assistance. You can get one of our blueprint plans available from Rubrik to help you get a framework to start with. Now, Rubrik here, cyber resiliency is something we take to core. Um, it's, it's a core piece of our business. And at Rubrik, we are not prevention, right? We understand that you, know, you still need to spend money at the physical edge and at the network and at the endpoint. We're not trying to replace those. We are going to add value on top of this stack. Unfortunately, we know through industry uh, and experience that the network edges devices still get all the way uh, intact, still get all the way through these uh, type of uh, endpoint protection. 75% um, of the companies that were impacted last year actually got to date antivirus signatures, court and so folks. You also have to protect against the rogue internal employee. And so if it makes it all the way through this crunchy outside edge and gets your data and your impact, if you're down to the question of how fast you can recover. Now, recovery starts with immutable backups. It's an absolute must. You need to have it in your toolkit. It's really the only proper defense against ransomware today. You guys all have passed the test in the poll when we asked this question. And what I mean by immutability is this. So when a ransomware attack comes in, again, that first thing it's going to do in the old model, it's going to go out and take out your disk to disk targets. It's going to take out your backup products. And it's going to take out your primary production systems and it's going to encrypt your storage. With ransomware uh, attack comes into an environment where rubric has been employed, it still may take out the production systems and find the file shares, but it's not going to be able to impact the rubric system. And the reason for that is our file system is absolutely air-gapped. It doesn't have any external protocols. It's not discoverable. It's not monitorable from the network. It's also an append-only file system. And what that means is data can only be written into it. It can never be changed or modified once it's been committed into the system. And so that gives us a natural immutability layer. And those fit together with the natural immutability and the air gap protection give us a strong, resilient copy of your data to bounce back for things like a ransomware attack. 
Now, if you were doing a manual recovery and you had a backup, you know, you're going to still have to do some identification of what's happening. So first thing you have to know is that you were impacted and identify what that anomaly was. Was it a ransomware attack or bad external actor or bad internal actor, one of the two? Then you really need to figure out what the impact is, you know, what I like to call the, uh, the blast radius. And this is a pretty time intensive process. Identifying the scope of that attack can often take days or more just to figure out what you need to recover. And then you have to try to build the recovery. You know, if it took out the backup architecture, you're maybe building backup systems first, rebuilding catalogs and pulling tapes from things like Iron Mountain and bringing it back in. Very complex, very time consuming. This entire process, customers tell us, take days to weeks to get started if not months to get back to steady state operation. Now at Rubric, we help this through an accelerated process and it's very straightforward and simplified. After every backup, we take a backup index and we build a, a baseline that's taken into our Polaris platform and we run it through a machine learning driven model looking for anomaly detection. This has been trained in this model to look for things like abnormal user behavior and signatures of ransomware. It's all done programmatically at an API level. And when we see a deviation in this analysis, what we're going to do is we're going to automate the discovery of that blast radius and show you exactly what was impacted with clear visibility into where and when those files were intact. And then because we have an immutable guaranteed copy of your data, we're going to leverage one of our fast instant recovery technologies like instant virtual machine recovery, live mounting of databases, or file level recovery, and help you get back to the last known good version before the attack happened. Now, that machine learning that we're doing is driven through um, a model that's been pre-trained. Um, it's got dual pipelines in it. The first pipeline is looking at file system analysis, so the heuristics of how the files are modified, accessed, changed, or deleted, and by who. And then we do a content wear analysis. It's looking at things like entropathy, magic byte header modifications, extension, and ACL modifications, the typical impact signature to what a ransomware would do. We bring this together to this pre-trained model, but because it's pre-trained, it works on day one. So the minute you turn on radar, your backups that are being under management by rubric will automatically get the value added benefit of being analyzed and protected by radar. It does get smarter over time, but the false positive rate is less than 1% uh, on the day zero baseline, and it gets less to be 1% of 1% over time. Now let's show it to you here in action. So, First thing I did before we started the webinar today is I went off and I encrypted, uh, launched an encryption attack. So I ran some ransomware against this file system here, here and you're going to see that these files have been encrypted. And so I've got a set of data here that's been impacted. And I didn't encrypt everything, but we encrypted a good number of files. And so I know that I've got you know a few hundred files here, um, the system that I just need to get back to before the attack. And so a backup was taken. And what you're seeing here on the screen is actually the Polaris GPS module. And GPS, again, is just that manager managers of single pane of glass. And everywhere you see a green dot here is a rubric cluster somewhere in the world. Um, but as part of uh, GPS, we also have the ability to turn on the license feature of radar. And when radar has been turned on, it just sits in the background. It's watching when these backups that get sent up here under management. And when it sees an analysis that flagged that model, it's going to raise the alarm. And as I see that I have that here, and I detected a high level of anomalies uh, from file system activity and high levels of encryption activity. Kind of the typical pattern in what you would see in a, a ransomware driven type of attack. It tells me when it detected it, on what system it did, and then what kind of files were impacted, modified and changed and deleted. Now the beautiful part about radar is I can actually peel back the layers of the onion, drill right into the file system and see exactly what was impacted. And as I get to the file shares here, you'll see where that kind of encryption tax took, a plot, took hold. And here's a good example, right? You know, the good version of the file was securely deleted, an encrypted version was added. It also had the right signaturing for a ransomware attack. And again, we're using heuristics instead of uh, virus signatures because you know ransomware attacks today are zero-day type of attacks. And so even if there is not a signature in the wild for this, it's going to catch it because of the heuristics. Now, I know I need to recover, and recovery with Rubrik is very straightforward because we have all the previous backups under management. I can give you the ability to drive flexible recovery. You can download in place. I can recover over the original files that were impacted, and you know, I can recover to a new location. I'll take that last option. Obviously, most people who have a ransomware attack don't want to rec remove the original one because of uh, forensic evidence, but if I um, recover to a new location here, 
What's going to happen is Rubrik's going to go out, it's going to pull the backup catalog, it's going to take a look at the impacted files, and it's going to build the data set of what it's got to recover, but it's only going to recover the files that were impacted. This is the beautiful thing about radar. It's very surgical in terms of the way it approaches. It doesn't remove any of the bad, I mean, the good data, it only removes the bad data. And so if you were doing a mass rollback uh, type of recovery, you would be removing good data as part of recovering from the bad. With Rubrik, you only have to recover what was impacted. And so if I go into the recovery here, you'll see a folder popping up, and there it is. Right? So the files that were previously encrypted have now been recovered in the unencrypted form. And that's the power of radar. There's nothing to tune, there's nothing to twist, there's no knobs. You know, Rubrik takes the complexity out of the out of the framework uh, and does it behind the scenes through automation. And we give our customers a simple value add solution by having uh, the metadata under management with Rubrik. Now today, radar uh, can be used in any really file-rich locations that we have under uh, backup protection with Rubrik. So things like virtual machines, uh, NAS file shares and file sets. We have a special type of archiving we do as well called NAS Direct Archive, where we immediately can back up a file share and send it to a lower cost economical storage location, open systems, and then Windows Linux uh, file system. Numerous customers are rubric across many different verticals with some customers, obviously, um, we've been impacted by the ransomware. That's something that hits everybody, but customers who have bought, made the investment with rubric have been protected and we've been able to bounce them back without having to pay a ransom and get them back to full operational state. Just last month, the city of Durham, North Carolina, they were actually impacted with ransomware. They made the investment in rubric specifically because of the immutable backup system um, and that investment paid off in spades. We will fully recover the city without having to be and pay the ransom. Uh, the county was also impacted, and the county of Durham, um, except with the city of Durham, the county of Durham had another vendor, and unfortunately, we're not as lucky in recovering. Medical Center last June, um, they were infiltrated with the uh, malware data threat analysis attack, and, um, and they also had an encryption attack happen. Uh, every piece of data that was protected by the rubric system was 100% recovered. So. Uh, obviously, we believe what we do, uh, and we stand behind it. We have customers that, you know, that will stand up with us and, and share that same message. And so before we open it back up for the q and I will um, um, uh, just plug the fact that you know, technology is one of our, our best partners. Um, they obviously have the discipline um, of data protection as part of their uh, service offerings. You know, feel free to engage them if you have additional questions on what we just covered here today. Um, and if you want to um, investigate this deeper, we're happy to support you. And thanks for the time. We appreciate being here, and we appreciate the partnership with technology. Let's try and I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you, David. There's a reason why I say you're one of the sharpest guys I know. It's uh, it's always nice to to work with you. So get my desktop shared over. Um, all right. Well, let's take another poll. Uh, Melissa, if you don't mind kicking that off for us, I'm very curious to see how many people are 100% comfortable with their data security posture. Um, this is definitely a, a key question, right? I'm curious what the answers are here. And again, don't forget that survey at the end. Um, we definitely appreciate you guys and then you're, you're spending some time with us. So thank you again for that. All right, let's go ahead and see these results. Yep, so about right. Um, I, I guess I should have uh, mentioned that we're not gonna show us to your boss or anything, so you, you can be safe uh, getting that through there. Um, so if, when we think of change or attempting to achieve a goal, you know, that, that journey can be a significant challenge or really extremely uncomfortable. Um, so sometimes that discomfort is from a lack of time, resource constraints, uh, limited resource experience, um, even just like the plethora of options that are out there, right? The, all those different options you have to sift through. But the bottom line is you need a strategy in place to achieve those goals. So um, really, if, it's, if you don't have that, then it's really just wishful thinking, as, as we see from the quote in here. So for those that didn't say they, uh, they were 100% com comfortable, you know, what, what is inhibiting your journey? Um, you know, if we think of it as a puzzle, you know, what, what missing piece is preventing you from completing the puzzle? What puzzle piece makes you uncomfortable? And at technology, we have expertise in each of these areas and more that you see on the screen. 
and we can help develop the strategy and solidify the plan to bring you to that 100% comfort level. Now, today we focus on primarily three pieces, right? Um, you know, these, these puzzle pieces with, with DMAR talking about cybersecurity and Manning going over data protection and data management and David coming over and showing how rubric basically fits in each of those pieces. It, it goes to show that, you know, we're here to, to identify these key pieces, make our customer strategy a reality, right? So going beyond that wish that we referenced earlier. Um, when it comes to ransomware recovery, risk mitigation, and just an overall cybersecurity and data protection strategy, there are quite a few pieces that, that are touched by rubric, you know, coupling that with te the technology and data management and protection practice and the cybersecurity practice, we can absolutely help complete the puzzle. We can help make that uncomfortable journey of change and transition comfortable. Um, really, and we can go and make sense of the chaos. So I invite you to continue the conversation with us, right? Let's talk to DMAR about, you know, how a security assessment will impact you guys. You know, let's, let's help, help you understand what a risk mitigation roadmap looks like. And let's talk about how the, the, spin, the, the spin can be saved in the background, right? Um, let's engage Manny and his team and talk about how a data management conversation with the underlying uh, compliance and, and regulatory uh, governance type of models underneath really project into that data protection strategy. So we've heard from Manny and DMAR today, but I invite you to talk to other technology and team members, John Mendoza, our, our CISO, Juan, Fabian, and Robert, some of our data management and protection experts across the country. Um, we're happy to jump on the phone, you know, as David mentioned, talk about demos, POCs, get really deep and personalized from the, the technical deep dive into your environment. Let's talk about what a data management assessment looks like, a risk assessment looks like. Let's talk about how a security workshop will benefit you. Um, and I'm happy to make that love connection. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. My last name's in Atrocity, so it's my first name at technology.com. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to put you in, in touch with the right people. So with that, um, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, let's go into that Q&A session. And let's see. So when, when we talked about some of the challenges listed up there, one of the ones that we didn't reference was COVID-19 specifically. Um, and Manny, you want to take that one because I know there's some pretty shocking stats on that. And I know that from a resourcing standpoint, we can help, but I'll pass it over to you if you want to. Take that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Trent. Yeah, COVID nineteen is uh, is uh, has really changed the game uh, in on many aspects, right? I think uh, from the simple, uh, you know, I've heard organizations and customers say that they've had a challenge just getting their laptop to work uh, because they never had to use it from home or they never had to log in remotely from home. Uh, so, so just getting through that. The other thing too, from a security perspective, obviously. Um, there's more vulnerabilities uh, exposed, right? Um, the, the other thought is, um, you know, if you, if you look at some of the um, interesting facts that since COVID or over the last three or four months, um, cyber threats have gone up 300%, right? So these bad actors, these hackers are actually taking advantage of the situation and, and really trying to impact uh, uh, the world a little bit more than it already is. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, yeah, so Dimar, I got one for you. Um, you know, we heard you t your take on on availability and and how that directly relates to cyber how that directly relates to cybersecurity and data protection. Would you say that out of the those principal tenants, um, availability is the most important one? Um, no, I I actually. Uh, probably jump the gun and answer that question via type, Trent, but I'm happy to go into it. The, uh, out of the three principal tenants, no single tenant is, you know, more important than the others. There, there is no one ring to rule them all, right? It's, um, it's more like a, like a three-legged bar stool. And if, if one of the legs is poorly structured, then, you know, you end up on your butt in spilled beer. It's not a, uh, it's, it's not a, a a universal mechanic, but all three of the tenants fit e to each other hand in glove. And it's a, it's an ecosystem. And so one of the things that we see is that, you know, folks are really more concerned around the confidentiality piece. And so they'll do things like, well, I've got data at rest encryption on, on uh, 
this box. You know what? In retrospect, I wish we would have put something out of a polling question. If um, if there are you know folks out there that are encrypting their data already, do they feel like that they could be at risk from ransomware encrypting their data? Can you be encrypted if you're already encrypted? And the answer is yes. And so uh, I've talked to a number of customers over the years, a number of clients that they uh, they're always surprised by that answer because. You, they don't necessarily look at it as though, well, you've got a lock on the door in the house. If somebody comes in and puts all your stuff in a foot locker and then locks the foot locker, you still can't get to your stuff. And so that, that's a great example of how availability is affected by um, encryption, which is really a subset, like I said earlier, of confidentiality. So all of the tenants have to work together uh, in a symbiotic environment effectively so that you can provide a, a reduced risk and you can make sure that your information gets to the people to whom it's entitled. Thank you, Debar. Um, well, in the essence of time, uh, what we'll do is we can take the rest of these questions. There's a few on here related to configuration and setup that maybe we'll take those offline and, and we'll get them answered directly to the individuals. Um, if that works, it, Manny, Demar, or David, do you have any questions on here that you want to answer immediately or are you good with a uh, follow-up? Uh, I'm good with any follow-up. If anybody's got anything, I'm happy to address it at a later time, Trent. Yeah, I, I'm looking at some of those emails as, or uh, uh, questions as well. And uh, you, could, you could probably answer them in a couple of paragraphs. It's probably easier to follow up and hopefully turns into a uh, – uh, either a Zoom uh, or hopefully soon a face-to-face -face discussion around, you know, requirements and what the uh, customers are trying to do for the attendees. Right. Okay. Great. Well, with that, guys, I'll, I'll thank you again for the time, everyone. Uh, it is much appreciated, especially during these crazy times. Uh, thank you, Manny, Demar, and David for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to be working thank with you, you on, on things like this. Um, you know, it's, it's, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. I hope everyone's family is, is safe and healthy. You know, it's, it's, it's a trying time with furloughs and layoffs and, and illness and things like that. And, and we're here to help, right? So all the technology engineers, the sales reps, the, our, our best of breed partners like Rubric, you know, we're here to make you guys' life a lot easier. So we're here, we're, any way, shape or form we can do it, we're, we're here for you guys. So hope to see you in person sooner rather than later. Again, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm easy to get a hold of, Trent at technology.com, and uh, happy to get the right people in front of you. So um, thank you again, and uh, God bless y'all. Thanks, Trent. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks, everyone.